All right, so we're going to start the last section of this class dealing with pre-algebra and how to set a foundation for their high school algebra. So I'm going to begin with um, putting it in context of their education. So where does it fit? Where does algebra fit in the overall scheme of uh, elementary and then intermediate um, math education? <coughs> Believe it or not, we start a little bit with equations on the primary level. A little bit in second grade and third grade, especially third grade, where we're finding the missing number. We don't use variables. We don't want to confuse second graders by putting a letter, an alphabet letter, in their math problem. Okay, That's abstract. So even primary students start the basis of finding missing numbers. And of course, algebra is finding miss missing numbers that we use variables to represent. So that's what an algebra equation is, in, in essence, is finding a missing number or a missing value when you're solving. So we do set, start setting the stage well, um, well before they actually take algebra. Elementary. In the elementary grades, grades four, five, and six, in grade four, we start learning to follow steps and doing problems in a particular order. And all of that is very important. It's important for any branch of mathematics, but algebra is easy as far as the computations go. But it becomes, it's harder because it's abstract using letters and variables and expressions. Um, so it is more abstract, but it's actually easier to do than some of the computation and arithmetic. So in fourth and fifth grade, we are learning some basic properties of numbers. We are learning to do things step by step. Then fifth grade actually introduces a real equation using a variable to represent the unknown. Usually it's the letter N, we're finding a missing number, or the letter X. All right, and then by sixth grade, we are going to be learning algebraic format for our equations. We're going to be learning um, to actually solve simple equations, solving them and checking them. And so there is a bit of a transition to make, which is what we will talk about um, a little bit later is transitioning from arithmetic to algebra. For example, when I said in fifth grade and especially sixth grade, we start transitioning into algebraic form, we are not going to write the time sign anymore because what does that look like? An X. All right, and so we are going to, um, for example, in fifth grade, here's the perimeter formula. Of course, using formulas and letters is a good way to transition, right? What does this formula look like by the time we're out of sixth grade and in seventh grade? It's got to look like this. So we have to real get transition from using the time sign to realizing this is called a numerical coefficient and all coefficients are multiplied. So we don't have to have the time sign. We don't even have to have the little dot between a number and its variable, between a numerical coefficient and its variable. All right, so we will transition away from the time sign and we will have to teach the difference between algebra or arithmetic and algebra, even in a formula. And that way we, we are doing something they're familiar with, but we don't have to say the time sign. We can just say 2L plus 2W, and that just, they have to learn the implied multiplication. Lots of little things like that. And so then by the time we're in sixth grade, we will be doing simple algebra problems. Before sixth grade, really, if we have an equation, it may not be in algebraic format and we'll only have one step to solve. But in those elementary grades, we're not really going to be doing a lot of algebra, but we can be solving equations and we can be transitioning. We can be learning how to do things step by step. Okay, so in your middle elementary grades, you want to be learning how to do step by step problems. 
you want to be learning some basic definitions and start learning some, not definitions, number properties. Commutative, associative. Um, by sixth grade, they're actually learning the formal names, the commutative property, the associative property, the in identity, and so forth. All right, but then pre-algebra will actually be taught in grades seven and eight. Many times the entire eighth grade year is called pre-algebra, and they do some arithmetic review, they do some geometry, but uh, pre-algebra begins officially in seventh grade. There will be a section, a chapter or two, a unit possibly on uh, pre-algebra, and what we do in pre-algebra is we have to do the transition, especially in seventh grade. So we want to be transitioning to algebra. That means new terminology. That means using multiple variables. That means writing things in a step-by-step -step form. That means doing things more horizontally than vertically. All kinds of things are involved with that. Also in seventh grade, we're going to be solving equations and doing simple story problems and doing simple uh, algebra simplification, like combining like terms. We are going to learn the distributive property and learn how to clear the parentheses, just a few basic things. And most important of all, I put it last because it's important that you are going to be really the one to teach, if you're seventh grade, teach them how to do negative numbers. All right, so that's a big part of seventh grade. Um, I'm going to be starting the pre-algebra unit soon in seventh grade math, and my main goal is doing the transition, getting them used to writing things in algebraic format, algebraic order, um, doing things step by step, and the big goal is going to be negative numbers. If I can get the seventh graders founded in their negative numbers, then they're going to be ready for pre-algebra the next year. So pre-algebra begins in seventh grade. We want to transition them. We were, we're going to be continuing to do our story problems and our equations and simple algebra, but the goal there needs to be negative numbers. So I'm going to be concentrating on negative numbers. And I'm going to be going back and learning and making sure everyone knows the commutative property, the associative property, those number properties. So it's a big, important time, but especially the negative numbers. So my goal is negative numbers in the next few weeks. Eighth grade. Eighth grade is when many students take an actual class called pre-algebra. So it's possible they will spend at least a whole, a whole quarter of their year on it, possibly even a whole semester. So pre-algebra, kind of depending on the setup of the school um, and so forth. Um, if you're using an ACE in a homeschool setup, um, there will be an entire section, an entire year probably on pre-algebra. You're going to take pre-algebra, okay? So in eighth grade, pre-algebra, um, things that need to be taught. Things that need to be taught in eighth grade would be, number one would be algebra, terminology, and formatting. Algebra, terminology, and formatting. Next, here they are again, negative numbers. Negative numbers, probably if you were the eighth grade teacher, you'd want to start over with the negative numbers. Because by the time they get to algebra one, negative numbers have to be just be part of any problem. They shouldn't need any special treatment by ninth grade. All right, so the negative numbers. Um, the next thing that they'll be working with is algebraic expressions. An algebraic expression is something like this. 2x plus 3y. That's a simple one. All right, so, or they might be doing 2x plus 3y plus 7x minus 4y. And then we even have a negative number and be learning how to simplify by combining like terms. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be dealing with next is 
algebraic expressions, two things, simplifying them and evaluating them. So if we talk about simplifying, the first thing we're going to learn to simplify, we're going to learn to simplify by combining like terms. And notice, there's a lot of things with writing this answer. We have to be aware of the fact that, okay, when I do that, I automatically write 9x minus y. You do too, probably, right? But what do we have to teach them? We have to teach them to put the x term first, which they probably would because it's first in the problem. We also have to teach them about understood negative 1. We have to teach them every little thing about algebraic expressions. Teach them the terminology. Okay, so yes, I should put that in there. Let's add it. Even though I've said it earlier, we're going to have to go back to terminology and then we'll learn how to simplify. So just go back and you add a number one and bump simplify and evaluate down. Okay, because we need to teach the terminology. Um, we're going to be coming back to that. Numerical coefficient, right? Or just coefficient, literal coefficient, many times just the variable. And then this is a term, this is an expression, and in fact, it is what kind of expression? It has two terms. So it is called a, oh no, binomial, <laughs> binomial, binomial. All of those things. And the whole time you're thinking, okay, um, when I talk pre-algebra, which I haven't done that for a while, I'm the algebra teacher, so I, I was already looking ahead. Okay, I want them to know this, 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 and this. So you need to do that too, whether or not you're the next teacher. Um, but the terminology, and there's a lot of the details of stuff that you have to think through because you're gonna, normal, you're gonna naturally do them in algebraic format, they will not. So you have to teach them the terminology which we'll come back to in, in more detail. Then we teach them how to simplify, first of all, by combining like terms. Then we have to learn to clear parentheses. So the, the two ways that you simplify most algebraic expressions, especially when we're beginning algebra, we're only really going to deal polynomials. We're not going to do radicals <coughs> very much, <coughs> at least not variables in radicals. So we have to teach them how to simplify that, and we're going to teach them how to clear parentheses. So, like terms. And there's a whole, a whole big thing here. We have to learn what like terms are. And then we're going to use the distributive property to clear the parentheses. Then we're going to put, to get, put them together. A two-step simplification would be to first distribute and get rid of the parentheses, then combine the like terms. Evaluate. Evaluate, we have to learn algebraic order. What do I mean by that? I mean order of operations, and then we have to teach them to do things in a horizontal manner. And then work down step by step by step. So think about it as training your eighth graders to do algebra, training them. So they have to know the terminology, they have to do things in certain orders and so forth. So we're going to spend a lot of time on algebraic expressions. The terminology that we use, the formatting that we use, little things like understood one, um, and all the while we cannot hide from the negative numbers. Okay. Then we have to learn to simplify and evaluate them. Yes? When you said put the x first, is that because it has a higher... It's numerical order. order. Okay. Numer uh, no, sorry, alphabetical order. There's, there's algebra protocol, and we're, we're going to talk about that in order in, in a minute. It's called standard form. For example, if you remember doing FOIL, whenever you do FOIL, the variables always fall in order. The x squared term is first because it's higher power. We don't care about the numerical coefficient. Then the x term and then the constant term. It's algebraic format. And all of that should be taught. And then it has to be enforced. Okay, so then when they don't write it in alphabetical order, 
they get docked. Okay, so all of this is learning how to do algebra. And algebra is really very simple, but it has to be very orderly. So students that are messy, students that are um, cannot do things step by step, you, it's crazy some of the things that I see in seventh grade when we have an order of operations problem. They've got math literally all over the page and they leave it, this part up here and they do the math multiplication here and then they keep going and they forget to come back and pull that addition down. Well, they should have been copying it step by step and that's something that needs to be trained. And once they get that down, they're going to do well in algebra. But if they're disorganized and messy and miscopying constantly, it won't matter if they know the concepts, they're still going to get poor grades. All right, so we've got then um, algebraic expressions. Then, of course, equations. Equations, multi-step equations, equations that have to be simplified. We're going to be doing, basically, uh, in our school here, the pre-algebra class does beginning algebra. They don't just do pre-algebra which would be just learning negative numbers, learning seventh graders do the pre-algebra, even sixth graders a little bit. But eighth grade is kind of beginning algebra. Um, in our school, we've set it up so that they are, I, when I start them in algebra one, I'm starting, I'm starting in chapter four. I'll go through and review negative numbers, make sure I don't have any problems with negative numbers. We'll go through and review a little bit, but I basically start with chapter four. And then I'm, every year I'm able to finish that textbook and actually take them a little further because um, we've got it set up, the pre-algebra class is in such good shape that I can take the algebra class beyond the algebra one book. They don't like it, but oh well. <laughs> We're, we go further with the functions and the graphing and the imaginary numbers and a few other things. And it's all because of the pre-algebra foundation is so, so well done. So anyway, so we're going to do equations and then story problems. Everybody hates them, but how to set them up. And the main thing they, we want to learn in eighth grade is how to translate. How to translate. What I mean by that is um, four less than rid of some more of the backboard stuff. Four less than twice a number. There's a word phrase and I have to translate it into an algebraic expression and eventually into an algebraic equation. And of course less than is always a problem and I'm always amazed at the word twice. I have students that want to do x squared. Right, so what's twice a number? It's two times a number. How do I write it? And then four less than. Okay, and that less than has to be addressed. But many times in algebra, you can go phrase by phrase and translate from the words to the algebraic expression almost in the similar manner that you translate language to language. You go phrase by phrase, you have to know vocabulary, you have to know formatting. So that's a very important pre-algebra skill is translation. Being able to take a word phrase and rewrite it as an algebraic expression and eventually then we can rewrite it as an algebraic equation. This is only a phrase, but then I will translate a sentence into an equation. For example, um, two more than a number is eight. Really simple. All right. That means addition. Two more than something. Two more than what? A number. I'm going to let that be n or x or whatever equals eight. Is is always the equal sign and so forth. This is takes practice and this is something that seventh graders start doing. Eighth graders need to be able to do it very well. And also, did I write this in the same order as the words? No, because when you translate from language to language, including from words to expressions, you have to use proper formatting. And proper formatting in algebra is that the constant term is last. 
Now, if this was subtraction, I can't flip it around. I might have to have it, but it's addition. Addition is commutative, so the order doesn't affect the sum, so I put it in the required order. The variable term, then the constant term. And all of these things are little details that are a big part of algebra. And these little details then need to be practiced from the very beginning. So I'm not going to let the students write 2 plus n. I mean, I'm not going to dock them at first, but I'm going to train them to write it n plus 2. Hopefully they won't be so well that they'll switch subtraction. You can't switch. They'll be, I don't want them to be in such a habit of always putting the variable first, but I will for addition. Subtraction has its own issues. So story problems. If we can teach our students how to translate, they're going to be in good shape for the story problems later. A few other things that are, is taught in pre-algebra is introduction to functions, okay? And then also working with the xy coordinate plane, being able to plot points and being able to plot lines, learning slope and x and y intercept and so forth, okay? So eighth grade, we are really going to start doing beginning algebra. We're going to take it beyond the connotation of just pre-algebra. And the things that were taught, we just went through. Um, one more thing with eighth grade. Throughout eighth grade, these, all of these above things that we've talked about, all of these, these things that we've talked about, um, let me just call it this, requirements for teaching the above topics. First of all, you must teach and use proper terminology. You must teach and use proper terminology. Don't allow them to get in, have bad habits. Um, then secondly, you must teach and use proper format. The whole idea here with these requirements is the idea that you know you don't want them to have bad habits. You don't want them, and I'm using the word teach and require because you have to teach and use them, and then of course you have to enforce them and require them so that you're setting good habits for algebra. All right. Um, the last thing with requirements is don't protect your students from negative numbers. Don't protect your students from translating and story problems. If you protect your students from difficult problems, all they're going to be is weak from the next year and the next year and the next year. All right, so that's the context of where pre-algebra fits and what's going to be taught and kind of what it is. Basically, pre-algebra is taught in seventh grade and really expanded on in eighth grade, sixth grade, and fifth grade, and fourth grade. We're just starting to give them little tastes of algebra terminology, little tastes of solving equations, and so forth. But especially in eighth grade and even in seventh grade, those requirements, you have to teach and use the proper terminology. You have to. That's a big part of that transition I mentioned from algebra to from arithmetic to algebra, and you must teach them and use proper format. All right, so that's one thing that's a little bit difficult if you're teaching upper elementary, is you may not yourself know some of the things, and you may accidentally foster bad habits and give out misinformation. So that's kind of the difficulty with, with teaching upper elementary, as the material is starting to get hard. All right. Um, it might be easier to teach because the students are older and have a foundation, but you've got to be careful that you don't propagate myths and establish bad habits for someone else to undo. It's very difficult sometimes to undo bad habits. All right, so now I'm going to give you the pep talk. Algebra versus arithmetic, or arithmetic versus algebra. Very similar to my pep talk on how much better and easier the metric system is. Same thing. Algebra is so much easier than arithmetic. Okay, so 
Um, a lot of times with seventh grade, they are, well, this year, they are excited to start pre-algebra. We just did statistics. Before that, we did geometry. We had to do all that volume, and we had to learn all those different uh, three-dimensional shapes, you know, the rectangular prism, the um, versus the rectangular prism versus the rectangular pyramid, the triangular prism versus all kinds of stuff, and cylinders and volume and surface area. Now we're going to be doing stuff that's actually can be uh, a lot easier. So al arithmetic versus algebra. All right, so I'm going to go through and contrast the two and then we can always begin with this. All right. Which problem would you rather do? <laughs> this one <laughs> or this one? All right, so when we're talking about arithmetic versus algebra, what we need to realize first is this may have a diff difficult concept. I don't think so. This has concept. This has a lot of computation. It has concept too. I don't mean that. This is maybe involves more concept, whereas this involves more computation. So that's our first difference between algebra versus arithmetic. We have more concept, more computation. So these are, here the concept may not be necessarily easier, but it's more familiar. So something that is familiar is easier. This might be a new concept. Okay. Here, the computation is capital E A S Y. Here, the computation is difficult. Maybe not difficult, but at least it is meticulous. It's detailed. It involves numerous individual operations. I have to estimate, oh, well, the first thing I have to do is I have to move the decimal. So this is more detailed and meticulous and multi-step than this is. What's the computation here? Oh, big deal, 10 minus one, and then nine divided by three. All right, so arithmetic is a lot more meticulous and time-consuming and detailed at first, at least. At first, and especially pre-algebra, the concept may be new. We have to learn to inverse. We have to learn to do the same operation to both sides of the equal sign. We have to do some of that, but the actual math computation is very easy, okay? There might be more steps and the concept may be different, but it's much easier. There isn't a single person in here that would rather do that long division decimal problem than that very simple, even though it's a two-step algebra equation, okay? So we have to realize how easy um, algebra is versus um, how tedious, nobody likes long division. That's what calculators are for. All right, so in general, we can portray how much easier algebra is on their computation, even though they're gonna be learning new things. Here, the concept is familiar, they've practiced it, but um, the, com the computations can be a real pain. So let's now go through actual content. We've already said that arithmetic is, can be 
um, can be a pain as far as the computation goes, but then there are some actual conceptual differences. Um, let's talk about number groups. Number groups. All right, in arithmetic, we do whole numbers. In algebra, what are they called? Integers. What's the difference? What do, what do integers include that whole numbers do not? Negative. Negatives, exactly. So an integer is the whole number and its opposite, which would be its negative. Okay, so whole numbers. Okay, whole numbers are the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, plus zero. All right, um, then as we go on, the next thing that we do in arithmetic, we learn how to do fractions. We learn what a fraction is. What do we do in algebra? They're not really called fractions anymore, though we do call them that. What's the new name? Rational, Rational number. Mm -hmm. And this comes from the word ratio. And the difference between a rational number and a fraction is fractions have um, a regular, what we call a proper fraction, and then we have mixed numbers. A rational number in algebra, there, this, no mixed numbers, okay? Instead of four and seven eighths, what are we gonna have? We're gonna have um, 39 eighths. There's no such thing as an improper fraction and there's no such thing as a mixed number. Algebra uses rational numbers. It's called reduced rational form. We don't have mixed numbers numbers. Okay? So in arithmetic we have our whole numbers that do not include the negatives. We have our fractions which are a little bit different in format versus our rational numbers. Um, the next thing we do is decimals. Right? Algebra does not use decimals or formats except story problems. Story problems and other applications are, sometimes you have to use a decimal equivalent or a decimal, especially if we have dollar signs and so forth. Um, and even story problems will use decimals and we will do some rounding and approximation, but we're not, we're not going to use decimals in basic algebra computations. We're going to use reduced rational form. We're going to use a rational number. Um, but then we also have irrational numbers. And sometimes in algebra, we will have to use decimal approximations for irrational numbers, but mostly in application. Um, irrational number, you remember, is a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. It's something that is not rational, something that cannot be put in fractional or reduced rational form. All right, the biggest thing that we'll deal with is square root, uh, let's say square root of two. That is an irrational number. It is a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. It is irrational. But in algebra, we don't use its decimal approximation, 1.4 something, 1.4, whatever, because it's irrational. It doesn't terminate. It doesn't repeat. In algebra, we leave it as square root of 2. 
Now, if we're doing an application problem, maybe involving the Pythagorean theorem, we might give a decimal approximation if we're, if we're solving for the side of a building or we're solving something in an application problem. Yes, we will sometimes use de decimal approximations for irrational numbers. But in basic working with algebraic expressions and rational expressions and radical expressions, we don't go to decimals. We don't go to decimals unless they're given to us in the problem. We don't go to decimals unless it's a story problem and they ask us for a decimal approximation and they'll tell us where to round because we're doing an application problem and we're not going to answer square root of two feet. We're going to answer approximately 1.4 feet, okay? But other than that, decimals are kind of on the out because algebra is going to be done in rational form, not in decimal form. All right, so we have whole numbers versus integers. We have fractions versus rational numbers. In um, algebra, then, we have um, irrational is more and more taking the place of a decimal. We don't use decimal form out very much at all. All right, so our number groups are much different and are expanded upon in algebra. In algebra, we will teach specific number groups and so forth, and our number groups will be defined based on the number line, okay? And so there's a, there's a whole new, in arithmetic, we kind of learn how to do whole numbers. We learn how to do operations on fractions. We learn how to do operations on decimals. In algebra, we, learn, we work with different number groups based off a number line. The number line becomes a lot more important. And we'll talk about that later. I'm just doing a contrast here. All right, so the number groups are different. Next, operations. What are the four basic operations of arithmetic? What are they? Um, Addition. Subtraction. 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 Yep. What happens on the other side? How many basic operations in um, algebra versus the four in arithmetic? There's only three. We're going to reduce this down to two and add a third. We have addition. We have multiplication. And we have powers and roots. All of that basically is the idea of the exponent. When we raise something to a power, or then we take its square root, cube root, whatever. So we don't really, we do, we do a little bit of exponents in arithmetic, but they're not really arithmetic operation. All right, because we're always constantly getting our students ready to go on. But what happened, what happened to subtraction? What happens, what's going to happen to it? What's going to happen to division once we cross over into arithmetic? We have negative numbers now. Subtraction doesn't qualify as a separate operation. It becomes combined with addition, and we use negative numbers. And we use the sign rules. We use the idea of subtraction being the opposite. So we're going to change the sign and add. Just like we had integers, which included negative numbers, an integer is any of the whole numbers and their opposites. One and negative one, two and negative two, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of subtracting, we're going to be adding opposites. What happens to division? It's already happened. It already happened to division in, fraction, in the fraction chapter. What happened to division in the fraction chapter? We didn't do it. What did we do? 
Not inverse. Reciprocal. Remember, algebra is going to be done in rational form or fractional form. So their division is not done when we're in rational or fractional form. We're going to, instead of subtract, add the opposite. We're going to multiply by the reciprocal instead of dividing because things will be done in what's called rational form. We have a whole chapter, a whole unit in algebra on rational expressions. Okay? Because we don't, we're going to be changing the form of arithmetic. And we're adding exponents. And actually, this is more uh, practical in one sense because we learned that what is addition? It's, I'm sorry, what is multiplication? It's repeated addition, right? It's kind of like ex an expansion of addition. Instead of doing 4 plus 4 plus 4, I'm going to do 4 times 3, right? What, is ex what are exponents? Repeated multiplication. Instead of doing 4 times 4 times 4, I'm going to do 4 to the third power, 4 cubed. So those are why I really only need, I really only need three operations. I'm going to add, multiply, um, or raise to a power. Okay, so the operations are going to be different. Um, I tell the algebra students and I tell the seventh graders that subtraction is no longer necessary when we have negative numbers. That doesn't mean we're going, that it doesn't work. It doesn't mean, it's just that it's going to be now combined with addition. Um, division, same thing. We're not going to count it as a separate operation. We're not going to count it as its own operation. So then we have a differences in the th operations. All right, then symbols. On all of these differences do require what we've been talking about when we say we're going to transition from arithmetic to algebra. Let's contrast now symbols. And we're going to sometimes when we trans transition from arithmetic to algebra, we're going to change some things. Um, but actually all we're really doing is expanding. We're not really changing because the arithmetic still works. Algebra works. They can be worked together. But what we're going to do is just expand on the symbols from arithmetic. So let's start with this. Okay, so how do the symbols change? What does this mean over here? How do you read it? Plus. Plus. What does it mean? Add. Is there any other way you can read that in arithmetic? I don't think so. What about over here? Well, no, no, I don't mean clue, clue words. I mean just reading the symbol. It retains its plus. We're not changing it. We're expanding it. And it still, we still use the, it still means to add. All right, here it's still going to be a sign of operation telling us to add, but we're going to expand it to mean what? Positive number. Okay, and now it becomes a sign of direction, meaning that it's to the right of zero on the number line, meaning it's greater than zero. We don't do positive in an arithmetic. Okay, so we're going to be expanding on in arithmetic plus means plus means plus. 
Okay. So we are expanding. Now we have positive and negative numbers. Now the so-called addition sign is still an addition sign, but now it's also going to be a sign of direction. All of the numbers that are to the right, therefore greater than zero, are going to be called positive numbers. Now we don't write positive numbers. It's, the symbol becomes assumed, but it's still nonetheless an expansion. We're going beyond what we did in arithmetic. Here's the big one. In um, arithmetic, this is the minus sign. And it means to subtract. And it is still a sign of operation. Over here, minus is going to be phased out. We'll still do it. We still subtract, but we don't really do minus. We'll still read it, but practically speaking, when we use it and we actually do a simplification, we're not going to be subtracting, but we are going to be subtracting. It's kind of a conundrum, but we're phasing it out. And instead, we're phasing it out and it now is going to become a different purpose. It's going to have this, it's going to still, we'll still use subtraction. We can go back to our arithmetic when we're doing simplifying, but now more and more it's going to be read this way. It's going to deal with the idea that an integer is all of the whole numbers and their opposites. So when we want to do a sign change, we will use the negative sign and it can become opposite of, and it's telling you to change the sign from positive and negative or negative to positive. And it's going to be frequently used in conjunction with a parenthesis or other grouping symbol. Even this symbol, this throws seventh graders, drives them crazy. Okay, so this is red, the opposite of, and then it goes to our new meaning of our negative sign is opposite of, but now it's also going to mean negative number. And it will be just like addition, it will be a sign of direction, direction from zero. So numbers to the left of zero on the number line, um, or numbers less than zero. So now we're going to be negative. So when I come up to here, these two minus signs have different meanings. This reads the opposite of negative 3, which is positive 3. Opposite of negative 3. This is tricky. This answer makes perfect sense because this is telling me to change the sign and that does the operation and it would be related to addition. I would not add, I would change the sign, I would not subtract, I would change the sign and add. What's the answer here? The opposite of the absolute value of negative 3 and guess what it is? It's negative 3 because absolute value is always positive and the opposite of positive is always negative. Um, textbooks love to put that in the, the section on absolute value. But it does, it, it is confusing, but it does enforce the new meaning of the negative sign opposite of. So this, it's still kind of a sign of operation. But we are phasing out minus and we're going with sign change. Then we are adding, of course, the idea of negative numbers. The, Minus sign, more and more, is no longer read that way. It's going to be opposite of and negative. Okay, so symbols will change. How they're read will change. How they're handled will change. All right. We only have those four symbols, so then next on the list is the time sign.
and of course is a sign of operation. It means multiply. Okay, over here it is completely phased out. What replaces the time sign most of the time? Parenthesis. The parenthesis will replace the time, the, the X time symbol because we can't use two symbols that look the same for two different meanings. We, it just causes too much confusion with the variable X. We do not use the time sign. We transition out of it in junior high. So this is going to be the replacement. The parenthesis. Raised dots are only for repeated multiplication. We don't want to be using the raised dots. The raised dots get lost. The raised dots get sloppy and get longer and longer somehow and become subtraction. Or they get lower and lower. We don't want to use that little dot unless it's repeated multiplication. Okay? So we want to replace the time sign, time sign with the parenthesis. And often when we're doing an algebraic term like 3x, we don't need a symbol anyways. If we need a symbol, we are going to go with a parenthesis. And that's totally unnecessary. So the, um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to replace the time sign with a parenthesis. And we're, so what we've actually done is we've added a meaning to the parenthesis. Over here, we use parentheses in arithmetic. What do we use them for in arithmetic? We use them to group. And we teach students to do inside the parentheses first to prep them for algebra. Because in algebra, especially beginning in lower levels of algebra, the parentheses becomes one of the most important symbols. If you can use the parentheses, if you can um, remove parentheses with the distributive property, you can use them efficiently, you'll be fine because the parentheses in algebra has two meanings. Um, if something um, if something is, um, so our added meaning, we're going to have multiplication. As our added meaning, it does mean multiply, and it still means group. So now in algebra, the parenthesis has dual meaning. It's used for multiplication instead of the time sign, and it still groups. Okay? So that, that it's used to group to change the order. All right, so parenthesis is going to replace the time sign, okay? Um, we're not going to use it very much. Um, and then the, what happens next? What happens to division? What happens to this symbol? We've already talked about what happens to division. What happens to this symbol? It's going to be phased out. It's still used in algebra. It still shows up, but it's going to be replaced. Not as completely as this one, but it's going to be placed, replaced by a fraction bar. We will not use that. We certainly aren't going to use this. Okay? So just like the time sign will be, not just like, the time sign will have to be eliminated because it's confusing. We will phase this out just like we phased out subtraction. We will definitely abandon that. And we will use the numerator as the divisor. I'm sorry, the dividend. The denominator is the divisor. So the dividend goes into the numer numerator, the divisor goes into the denominator. So no more dividend divided by divisor, now it's dividend divided by divisor. So we will phase out the div division symbol and go to fraction formatting. Okay, so the symbols will change. 
somewhat. Some will be phased out. We're going to, actually, we're not really doing that much. This guy has to be eliminated. But other than that, we're expanding our use of our symbols and phasing out some and making, more, uh, making others more important. Okay, so um, Tuesday, we're going to continue with um, contrasting the two and then begin with the teaching part of algebra.